My name is Devin Lander. I'm the New York State historian. Some of you who have uh, been to these programs have seen me. Uh, welcome and thank you for, for attending. Uh, I just want to note that uh, Deputy Commissioner Mark Shamming is in the audience uh, and uh, has been very supportive of History Month and putting together the, the program. This is the fourth uh, that we've had in October. History Month is an opportunity for us to think about our history, but also think about the people who are, are working in the field, the historians, the archivists, the librarians who are collecting and preserving that history, uh, as well as the sites, the museums, the historic sites, uh, the locations where history took place. So we're very excited that um, we were able to have this programming in person again, and that uh, we had so many interesting speakers, including today. I would like to uh, introduce our, our guest, our guest speaker, Dr. Scott Manning Stevens. He is an enrolled citizen of the Akwesasne Mohawk Nation and an associate professor of Native American and Indigenous Studies at Syracuse University. There he serves as the director of both the Native and Indigenous American Studies program and the Center for Global Indigenous Cultures and Environmental Justice. Stevens earned his PhD from Harvard University and has held a variety of fellowships in his field, including the Radcliffe Fellowship. He is a co-author of three books and the author of numerous published essays and book chapters. His work addresses issues around native material culture, the history of ethnographic collecting and museum studies. Dr. Stevens advised the New York State Museum and wrote label texts for the 1957 Thomas Hart Benton murals titled, The Seneca Discover the French and Jacques Cartier Discovers the Indians, which are on display in our Adirondack Hall. So please, after this talk, if you haven't seen them, go take a look. Today, Dr. Stevens will be talking, will be get, delivering the talk, Pass Forward, Native America and Museums. Thank you. Sego Skanagoa, Yano Skana. I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's a it's a place I have been coming. My mother reminded me since I was four, <laughs> and um, and I've had issues with it ever since then. Um, so I, I thought, wow, I finally have the bully pulpit. I can talk. And obviously, I don't profoundly dislike it because they keep coming back. But I do come back with hopes that it will change. And it has changed over the years. But I want to talk about some of the general issues that face Native American people and museums. So as many of you know, Native America is most frequently coupled with natural history. Not history, natural history. So we're always just around the corner from a dinosaur. And when I was a kid, that always struck me. Why the dinosaur, right? Why us and the dinosaur? I don't see anyone else with the dinosaur. Is it the presumption of things extinct? I should hope not. But in the old museumology, it was all about the past. You had very little indication that there were living native people in your state, let alone in the country, right? Because all you saw was this world curated by a museum, selected, displayed for you. And it, you know, the same building that would have this rather stiff 1950s style mannequin. And this was from just a few years ago before they started to change the Field Museum. But this would have been standard stuff. Not too exciting. You don't learn a lot about a culture by looking at that kind of poor taxidermied figure um, in a hall near some dinosaurs. Not a dinosaur here, but a mastodon. Same theme that, you know, when I was a kid, I loved the mastodon, but I didn't necessarily want him coupled with my mother's people's history. And it's par for the course. You know, before there was a National Museum of the American Indian on the Mall in Washington, D.C., if you wanted to go see a contemporary Native art show put on by the Smithsonian, you didn't go to the National Gallery 
or to an art museum on the, the mall, you went to natural history. Even when it was someone, you know, an important um, figure from now who was showing his or her art, you still would have to be in the same building with dinosaurs, gems, and minerals, and things like that, as though... And I don't mind, you know, I, I certainly don't mind us being coupled with nature. We are all part of nature. It's just, why only us? You know, why the selection for that? So, if you're in a museum and the museum doesn't make you aware that there are Haudenosaunee and other Native peoples living in this state, of course, the Shinnecock in... Um, Long Island as well. You know, I'm always amazed. I teach at Syracuse, New York, right in the center of the Confederacy. And there are many students, especially students from the city, that will be like, are there reservations in New York? And it just makes my head explode. You know, you drive through one to get to campus. It is, you know, about four miles away. And it says when you're on the, you know, 87 or 81, through, you know, Onondaga Nation, you're driving through it, but it just, it's somehow invisible to people. So I always make them learn this map, you know, and I said, I want you, if I ask on a quiz, how many Haudenosaunee reservations, I want you to know them. Just like I'd like, I'd like them to know their state capitals, but they don't learn that either anywhere. It's very mysterious to me what is being taught or not taught. Um, so I, because I also ask them, what is the capital of New York State? And they often say New York. And I'm like, okay. Um, so it, and I should say too, I, um, as a Haudenosaunee man, as a Ginyangihaga or Mohawk man, so that's my mother's reservation at the top there, Akwasasne, means where the partridge drums. Partridge is a bird that flaps its wings to make a drumming sound in its mating dance. And that is something that they associate with that region there. The map is a little, um, well, it, it's a little hard to see what's really going on there because it's a, it's a very complicated space. The U.S. and Canadian border runs through the reservation. So we have two federal governments to bother us. And then we have the state government of New York. And then you'd think we'd just have one province, but the provinces of Quebec and Ontario meet in that territory. So we get two provincial governors to bother us. It's a real fun time. Um, but here we are in the shared homelands of the Mohicano, the Mo Mohican people and the Mohawk people. We both have at various times called this region our home, right? Um, Albany area beyond the pines, uh, which is where the word Schenectady derives from, actually. Skanakdage. Um, why there are two of them, I don't know. Because <laughs> the official name in Mohawk for Albany is Schenectady, Skanakdage. But here we are in these homelands in a museum dedicated to the history of the state. Now, it's not, of course just a natural history museum, it's a history museum. So it is for the whole state, but it does still have the mastodon issue that I, I was talking about. Recently, I was part of a group of people that advised the Adirondack Museum, now called the Adirondack Experience in Blue Mountain Lake, on the redoing of their, one of their main buildings, which was, it is called Life in the Adirondacks. And one of the things we noticed from the old building is it had no references to indigenous people in a place called Adulon Dax. <laughs> um, gee, you wonder where they got that kooky name. Um, and yet we were essentially invisible. Somehow the Adirondacks was Indian free. And so one of the first things we said most glaringly is you have to include indigenous people. This was our homeland. Again, a shared space between mostly Mohawk and Abenaki people as a hunting ground, and others lived in along the rivers there. And we said it also has to emphasize our contemporary presence and communities. And they have these lovely, that picture of that young 
boy, he's it's a actually a video, so it's that's just a still. He's talking about his homeland and his relationship to the Adirondacks from his home community at Aquasesne. And it we have a few of those so that it's not native culture preserved in amber and left in the past, but it's about these living traditions today. And so we have um you know, a thing on the the Freedom School at Akwesasne, which teaches uh, Mohawk language as the primary language to small children, so that they see it's a living culture, right? And that's one of the things we want a museum to be able to do. Or we have demonstrations by people from any one of the reserves, it could be Ganawage or Ganasatake as well, that come down and teach maybe basket, show how traditional splint baskets are made, or teach about our agriculture, the three sisters, and intercropping, and issues like that. All of them, again, to get us away from a museum as things in the past, as things put on the shelf to look at and contemplate without thinking, now this is actually the representation of a long-term multi-generational, multi-era you know, era nation that lives within this region. Similarly, we have um, activities in the summer, like there's a Mohawk and Abenaki market that, that comes to the, I say we because now I'm on the board, which is um, your reward for doing things like that, and they ask you for money. Um, so, um, But it is a labor of love. And I've been pleased with the real interaction you see going on there between indigenous people and young people or visitors of all ages. And it's inspired me to think, this is really what I want museums to be doing, is to be more, you might notice if you go to a native reservation where they do have the fortune to have an, a, a museum, they almost never call it a museum, right? It's usually called a cultural center. And it's called a cultural center not because of our normal allergy to the word museum, which we do have, but to emphasize the fact that there are all sorts of things going on there, right? Language classes, primarily, right? Um, dance, traditional dance, beadwork, if that's something done in your community, carving, basket making, all the things that are traditional handicrafts and arts of our peoples. And there, there's a great book by the scholar Amy Lone Tree. She's a Ho-Chunk scholar, teaches out in the UC system in California called Decolonizing Museums. And she holds up the Anishinaabe Cultural Center called Zebawing in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, as a primary example of a decolonized museum. And that's always been, you know, somewhat... Uh, controversial notion because a lot of people will say you can't decolonize museums. They are a colonial artifact in themselves. And that goes towards the renaming of them by pivoting the focus away from artifactual collections to cultural, living cultural events. And I've had the fortune of going to Zebuing, And what I loved about it was it is a people telling their own story, right? Not someone else, a group of experts from outside the community, telling you about them and putting their lives in vitrines and their objects there for interpretation by non-Indigenous experts. But it is the community telling you basically how they see themselves in the world and how they understand their history. And it is not an easy history, as it's not for most Indigenous people. There's, you know, disease, dispossession of land, boarding schools, dispossession of culture and language. There's substance abuse problems in endemically poor communities. The museum, the cultural center does not flinch from any of that, but it interprets how they understand how they got where they are. And I think every Every people represented in such institutions has the right to weigh in on how they're being curated for the public. 
There's a book when I teach museum studies course that I like. It's a collection of essays by Australian and Kiwi New Zealand scholars called Collecting, Ordering, Governing. And um, museums do have a part in each one of those things, right? How were things collected? That's a big question because there are ethical ways to do it and there are deeply unethical ways to do it. Grave robbing is one of those unethical ways, to be sure. And that's why we have the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. But it took until 1990 that anyone thought to make that a law, right? It used to be the case that a place like the Peabody Museum at Harvard had more human remains of Native people than there were living Native people in New England. That's a scandal, right? And that goes, and that's just one. That's just that's not just Harvard. That's many institutions that collected human remains for a kind of old racialist pseudoscience of race in in biology and anthropology, measuring crania to see how developed we were, etc. So in 1990, you have a federal law come through because of the activism of Native people to try and reverse some of the most egregious parts of this practice. And that meant returning funeral objects as well, things taken from graves and put on display. But then there are also culturally sensitive objects that have ended up in museums that weren't stolen, were purchased, all legal, but the person who sold them may not have had the right to sell them. And sometimes people sell things under duress, i.e. they're starving. And someone comes along and says, I'll give you 60 bucks for that medicine mask. And that sounds like a lot of money to you at the time. And so you have to think, how are collections made? All institutions like this have to scrutinize collections of cultural materials and ask, where does this come from? How did we get it? The other part, ordering, is similarly important. All museums order or interpret their collections. They're the ones that we turn over authority to as the public to tell us what we're looking at. And if they get it wrong, we get it wrong. <laughs> and it wasn't the tradition before, in the bad old days, let's say, for those experts to turn to the source community, the people living now, and say, what is this in your community? Because it was presumed we didn't know. Our oral traditions go back hundreds, if not thousands of years. We often know what the object is or its significance, but no one's cared to ask, right? And there are just ways of looking at things that you can't intuit no matter how expert your education is, you still need the voice of the source community to help you with that work. And I think that that's, you know, part of the change that's been going on in museums. I don't know if people have seen this in the Natural History Museum in New York, but it used to be um, in Roosevelt Hall, which was a kind of memorial to Teddy Roosevelt, right? Uh, there used to be a statue of him outside, a very problematic statue of Teddy Roosevelt, astride a horse with an African tribesman on one side with a spear and a shield, not an African-American, but an African tribesman, and then a Native American in full headdress, plains headdress. And that was to symbolize his activities as a person in the American West, TR, and also his later post-presidential safaris to Africa, etc. It was problematic in that it was a very hierarchical racial pyramid with, you know, TR on top, looking buffer than he ever did in life, I have to say. Um, I'm like, wow, he was pretty cool. Um, he's like a medieval knight on horseback. And then you have these attendant brown figures. Happily, that has been removed. But um, inside, in these vitrines, there used to be, you know, the Dutch meeting, meeting Native people um, and trading with them. And so they asked 
a descendant, um, Bradley Pecor, who's from the Stockbridge Muncie community now in Wisconsin, but the people would have been in the Hudson Valley, to help them with just reinterpreting this without taking it out. It's kind of almost literally a Band-Aid because they put it right on top of the offending image. And so you have these kind of super texts now imposed on the glass um, wall telling you what's problematic about this um, and so on. Um, it's an interesting short-term solution, I, I would hope. Everything's expensive. Let us say that. Everything is expensive. And when money is the issue, just understand, money is always the issue for every institution on the planet. They don't have infinite amounts of it. What they do do to make themselves go forward is they prioritize certain things. And so not changing this means it is not a priority of that institution. I know it will be expensive, and it's not a fun thing to, you know, to spend money on taking something apart. But if it's a necessary thing, then prioritize it. Right? But typical, you know, and they, they did a lot of this type of thing at the field for a while, but people soon got tired of it and thought, well, okay, that's nice for now. When is it actually going to change? Which brings me to this problem in this museum. I have hated this vitrine for ages. Why are our women here topless? Why bare-breasted? And here's my problem. Even if you could say, well, we know historically, I don't know that. I'm a decent historian of my own people. But I know that when you bring a bunch of fourth grade boys in front of it, they are not learning deeply about Haudenosaunee agriculture. They are not. They are also ribbing any native kid in their group. Oh, is that how your mom goes around? You know, it's embarrassing. It is an embarrassment to native people. That why should we? And I, I kept, you know, I've asked this question before. Our, you know, experts say that that... I'm sure Viking women weren't as prudish about being bare-breasted either, but I never see them portrayed that way. We live in a society where you can't even breastfeed a child in public. And yet, why is this okay? Through the racist logic that once guided National Geographic Museum. It's okay if they're brown. If you're looking at a white person's, a white woman's breast, you must be looking at pornography. But if it's a native, well, what does that say? We're closer to animals. We're not, it's not the same. I think it's deeply offensive. <laughs> I would like it to change. I said, if I could do one thing with this talk, it would be to have some group of witnesses that are not members of the museum understand how offensive this is. And it's not because, oh, I'm a Victorian and I just don't believe women have breasts. No, it's not that. But realize the average age in the United States at which you stop learning about Native people in public school is fourth grade. That is shockingly young. Because you think of what you teach a fourth grader. Not about genocide. Probably not about the horrors of boarding school. You teach them about Squanto and the first Thanksgiving and Pocahontas, and all these friendly native people that are seem to be helping settler colonialism establish itself. Sacagawea, the list goes on. That's who you leave school knowing, friendly Indians. And we are deeply marooned in the past. So when you have this to go along with it in your one you know, you probably come here twice in New York school system, fourth grade and seventh grade, because I remember in seventh grade, we studied the Iroquois Confederacy. But seventh grade is not going to be any better, more mature. But I still say that that logic of the National Geographic magazine is a deeply problematic one, right? And if it causes students of color especially Native students, discomfort, I don't see what's lost by putting a buckskin 
shirt on them. My mother said, I can make some at home. I'll send them with you. <laughs> Dress them while you're there. Because I think of our buggy climate and thorny world, really, really? I don't know. But I am saying, regardless of how, how factual your experts want to see it, I do not think it serves the purpose of education in this context. So, I mean, that's just part of, I needed to get it off my chest. I do have other things I want to think about when we talk about ordering. So collecting, okay, there's an area where there are sometimes problems. But ordering is similarly important. Interpreting these things. I would have guessed that no native person in the past worked on this particular vitrine. I could be wrong, but I'm just saying I don't think that that's how we would choose, given that it's an educational institution, to present ourselves. And similarly, you have to think about all the different objects and so on in a museum. What does the source community feel about those things being there? I remember seeing a pair of beautiful plains moccasins that were beaded on the bottom. And I had never seen such elaborate beadwork on the sole. And a Plains person I was with, native person, said that's probably because they came from a grave. Because we don't bead the soles of moccasins unless to decorate a corpse. Because it's obviously not practical. Beads are precious, the art would be ruined. And so they said when they see that, they would think, oh, why is that there? I don't know that. I just was, you know, an outsider thinking, that's pretty, right? And how many other times have we done that? Looked at things that a community member would be appalled to see a medicine bundle or a medicine mask. There used to be plenty of those around when I was a kid from Haudenosaunee traditions and things taboo for us to display. <laughs> I remember... Um, being before the pandemic, like 2018, I was at the National Ethnographic Museum in Stockholm in Sweden, and they had this horrible thing. I just thought, again, whose mind is behind this? It was a big vitrine, and you are told that it's filled with taboo items that only initiated female members of this tribe may see. Well, that's not me, and it's no one in Sweden. And here's the bad faith part of it. It had a cover over it, like a blanket, and it was your choice whether to look at it. They told you you're not supposed to look at it. It's like saying to a child, it's very special, don't touch it, and then you leave the room. What is the thing they most want to touch? What is probably the most looked at vitrine in that museum? And I'm, I didn't look, but I'm sure it probably is in, you know, Things that make no sense to people, you know, could be crystals or rocks or things, who knows? But it, just to do that, I just say, what is, again, what's the thinking behind this? It's not a peep show. It's an educational institution. And again, that could be dealt with if you really just turn to community curation. Of that museum, I do want to recommend, there's an excellent um, documentary not about the thing I'm just talking about, that's free to download or watch on, online through the Canadian Film Board called Totem. And it is about a totem pole, a funerary pole that was taken from the Hesla community on the West Coast back at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. And it ends up being gifted to the King of Sweden for their ethnographic museum. And they don't know what ever became of it from that community. They just, they knew someone cut it down and stole it. And then through the miracle of Google image, someone found it and said, our pole is in the center of their museum as their prized possession. Now, they're from Canada. There's no NAGPRA or Native American Graves Protection Act there. And Sweden doesn't follow that. So they had to argue on their own, and it takes several years for them to get the Swedes to agree that it might be returned. 
And they even very graciously send over some of their master carvers and build a replica of the pole in situ and invite Swedes to bring, have children, learn about the tradition and everything else. They bless it, they raise it. And then the government says, actually, the real one can't go home. The original can't go home because you need to put it in a museum. They don't want to put it in a museum. They want it to have its lifespan the way it's supposed to. And at some point, it will fall onto the ground and it will go back to the earth. And that will be its journey. But so when the movie ends, the Swedes have two. And you're just ready to, like, throw your TV out the window. Um, <laughs> Luckily, there's an addendum, a 20-minute addendum, that it does actually go back and in the original poll, and it's greatly celebrated and a very emotional, lovely thing. So it's called Totem, and it's well worth watching. I bring it up just because on that visit, I thought, oh, I'm going to go see the poll that they carved, that the community carved for it. Could not find it. It's hard not to find a 40-foot object. And um, I finally asked... A guard, I said, where's the totem pole that you had? And they said, he said, oh, the, he said, that's out in the park in the woods. I said, outside in the cruel elements of a Swedish winter? He said, well, it's not real. I thought, uh, you know, <laughs> this is, you know, it's not real. They made it for you, like master carvers from the same families that carved the original. But it's that kind of fetishization of the real, the authentic, that somehow made itself inauthentic. And now it's, if you do want to see it, go to that park near the museum and it's there, wasting away. So ordering, interpreting is something that was long done with no attention to a native community. And now I think things are changing. I mean, it does my heart good to come into this, you know, place today and see that contemporary exhibit of Haudenosaunee art. I know the art of many of those people, they're important in our communities, and that is, to me, that's a sign that things are going in a better direction. Though this remaining <laughs> still, because I, I asked, I thought, well, I haven't seen it today. I was gonna say, I'm going to talk about it, and they'll be like, oh, we took that down. But apparently, you didn't take it down. So there's that. Besides ordering, there is also governing, right? And what do we mean by governing? Well, in that book I talked about, which is a collection of essays, they're looking at the relationship, say, of the field of anthropology to collecting and the field of museumology to ordering. In governing, they mean in several ways. The main way they mean it is, how are the peoples represented, governed in that society? Meaning, well, for Native America, it's largely through disenfranchisement. You know, we were herded onto reservations. We weren't citizens until 1924. Our children were taken away from... That's how we were governed. And a lot can be in, then seen in museums reflect that we're a kind of substrata of American political life until Native activism following a lot of black activism in the civil rights era produces things like the Red Power Movement, the American Indian Movement, and there's a desire to take things into our own hands since they're not going to be addressed for us. But there are kind of economies of thought that these writers I'm talking about point out in governing. One is that the museum may reflect how a people live in that settler society like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the U.S. So again, by settler colonialism, that is just a distinction that has developed more recently in schools usually in colleges. Um, before, we just talked about the colonial, Europeans running stuff. But Patrick Wolfe and other scholars in Australia noted there are two types, main types of colonialism. One is extractive, and that's where a foreign power, usually European, goes and just plunders the resources of a place, like Africa, right? Including taking people. 
you know, as labor. That's extractive. Settler colonialism is you do want the resources, but the primary resource you want is the land. And you go with the intention of replacing the population that's already there. That's either through moving them and dispossessing them, or through killing them, or through both. And that's what happens in the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. It's easy to understand that at one point in history, in 1491 in North America, we were 100% of the population. Right? Now we are somewhere around 2% of the general population. So we have been demographically overwhelmed by settlers. Same in Canada, same in Australia, same in New Zealand. That means when we talk about how are people governed, sometimes that law, those, those same ways of thinking that make us inferior and the, thus justify the taking of our land and the suppression of our culture, a kind of eugenic thinking was very typical of museums. And they point out it's a two-way street, this museums. They don't simply reflect their society. They often authorize their society. Remember, museums are a public institution that we often, so we, we assume they're going to try to be objective. We don't tend to think of the narrative being told by a museum, but there is a master narrative told by museums. Right? Whether, like if you go to the Smithsonian Museum of History, there is a master narrative being told there. And it's a pretty happy one. Right? Always progress. Always, for, you know, people came here for religious liberty and opportunity and progress. And those are the things you're going to see emphasized over and over again. You don't see them taking away the religious freedom of people. I don't think of the Puritans, uh, they may have escaped for their own reasons, but uh, you know, if I was a Quaker, I'd be leery of them because I'd probably be at the end of a rope. So religious freedom aside, you know, when did American native religions become legal? 1978. Thank you, President Carter. Um, you know, how is it that we needed our religions legalized in 1978. So museums often were the kind of in kind of implicit okay for that system because it made us primitive. It put us with the dinosaurs. It put us as primitives in the past and locked us there. And so well your culture, you know, settler culture brought them schools and reading at what great cost, right? The loss of our own language. The surest way to strip people of their identity culturally is to take away their language. And so with all that said, I just think we need to think of all those aspects, collecting, ordering, governing. There's also governing collections, meaning who has access to it. And who may intervene on it? Who may, say, if you say, I, I think you have some items there that are not supposed to be there and belong to my community. All the museum has to do is say, we're not allowing you access to it. Ownership is ownership. And so all of these things require that ethics be the backbone of them, or there is no future forward, right? There are no pathways forward if ethics don't drive this collective experience. We're trying, we want these to be educational institutions, not colonial trophy rooms. And I, I'm a great fan, as I said. I don't study museums because I inherently hate them. I think they have great things to do. And I love material culture. I love objects because... They're another form of expression. They're another kind of authorship. And it doesn't leave us just with the tyranny of the written word. Well, it was written down by these, by these what? Colonists, missionaries. I don't want my history to come from them. I'd rather try and intuit it with the help of my community from objects from the past. And so I guess I'll, I'll leave with that, that 
if ethics aren't the backbone of this whole project, we're not going to go forward. There are definitely things to change. There are things that have changed in that wonderful exhibit out there and other changes along the way. I mean, this is a dyma dynamic institution, but I would like it to address some of those vestiges of the past. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. You know, I go. I'm just putting this up as a native. Um, it's a native cultural center along Onondaga Lake in, outside of Syracuse, which is, again, it used to be this thing called St. Marie among the Iroquois. Not our choice. <laughs> um, and what was suspicious about having it as St. Marie among the Iroquois, the Jesuits had a nothing mission to our territory. Nine months. Barely time to have a baby. Um, nine months and they're gone. They build no chapels. They, they leave no converts behind. They're driven out. And yet it was built in the 1930s, not this building, but a fake fort and a chapel to commemorate Christianity coming to central New York. It was a WPA project. You had to put all hands to work. Fair enough. It fell out of interest. I'm glad. But the building behind the a number of uh, professors at Syracuse and other institutions in the area, along with the Onondaga community, thought, why don't we use that space to tell the story about the founding of the Confederacy and the great law of peace? And so that's really what it's become is a space, again, to tell our story from our perspective, right? Emphasize the things we value in it along the way, talking about our history and so on. So I, I definitely invite you to visit it if you're that way um, and you're out in Syracuse and Onondaga territory because it is really an opportunity to, to gain our perspective on this particular issue. It does address things like boarding schools and broken treaties and the usual things we talk about because they're part of our lives and history. But it really emphasizes the continuance of this powerful message of peace. And it's not just peace, meaning no warfare, but almost like the peace which passeth no understanding. And that, are you at peace with your neighbor? That's important. Are you at peace with your family? That's important. And are you at peace with yourself? Really important. So it's part of what we say is having, being of the good mind. Peace is balance, it's health, and, and it's honesty. And so I, I, I really like the work that they've done there. Um, and it is a place I'm so much happier to know that local fourth graders are being taken to learn about Haudenosaunee culture than some phony fort celebrating a non-mission to our people, right? But anyway, that's a different story. So, any questions? I'm happy to. Is that the only Native People's Cultural Center in the state? No, there's the um, Sokawi, which is on Oneida territory, is is another. Um, there's one at Akwesasne. The it's a library and cultural center, but it has a lot about our material culture. Um, there's an excellent one in Seneca territory, um, which is their national museum. A beautiful building, too, purpose-built for that. It wasn't, like, usually we're in retrofitted buildings. Um, but they, in Salamanca, New York, is where this uh, um, museum is. That's a gorgeous one. And um, if you know Ganondagon State Historic Site, it is a state historic site, but it is, it's in Victor, New York just south of uh, Rochester. And it's on the archaeological site of Ganondagon, which was a thriving and large Seneca settlement that was burned to the ground in the 17th century during the French invasion. Um, and its archaeology is, is in the space, but they have a beautiful, again, purpose-built cultural center slash museum that does really wonderful work. So there are increasingly more. And in Canada, 
um, in Brantford, where the Haudenosaunee are also at Six Nations, there's the Woodlands Cultural Center, which is right next to their horrible memory from the past, the Mohawk Institute, which was the residential school that they suffered under. And there was a lot of question as to whether to tear that building down because it was so traumatic. But in the end, I think they wisely decided to make it a center for the hist- to study the history of the residential school system and to keep it at, because they thought if they're all torn down, someday in the distant future, people say, I don't believe they ever existed. And that's the way that you know what the news is like here. You know, oh, you say there were these things. I don't know that there were these things. And so they called the campaign to raise funds to restore it, save the evidence, which I thought was really smart. So, but yeah, so there are, there are a number of these places one can go and one can learn a lot and from our perspective. So I'm happy about that. Yes. As far as I understand the the new standards, I mean, they've tried to address things around cultural sensitivity that they didn't before, though that still requires, I, I don't know that it has much teeth to it. I mean, they're recommendations. And whenever there's a recommendation that isn't a law, you really are depending on the goodwill of the institution. Yeah, it reminds me of, you know, the United Nations passed a declaration um, in the early 2000s on the rights of indigenous people, right? It has the unfortunate acronym of UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And it's a non-binding declaration. Well, what is a non-binding declaration? That's like saying, um, don't murder those people if you think about it, you know, like if you care to agree. So it's non-binding, and yet four countries voted against it. The United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So if you didn't believe in settler colonialism before, you better believe in it now, because it certainly believes in itself. And they have all since now accepted. It was, you know, ad- adopted under the Obama government. It was, a- But it's, again, it's a cynical gesture to even adopt it because you don't have to follow it. And it says nothing radical. It's not like land back and things like that. It's like, don't kill them anymore. Okay. Let them speak their language, practice their religions. I mean, it is the most mild-mannered declaration you're going to come across. And yet, those four countries, our own included, felt compelled to vote no. So, that's kind of how I think about that. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yes, Gwen. Uh, one of the things I really like about the Adirondack experience in the Nebraska area, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but you can tell us a little bit about racism, is the commitment to understanding the museum space is something that continues to change. And I think right. there's a perpetual problem in all museums. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Exactly. So there is a, you know, there's strategic planning about the uses of the space and how it may be adapted. Some things will be more or less permanent because of structural and historic, meaning certain, ex, you know, exhibitions or exhibit objects. But in general, the move is to make the spaces flexible. Um, you know, we, we've we done different, it's a campus museum, so there are, are experience. Um, There are many buildings at the Adirondack experience. One is this Life at the Adirondacks, which is a huge building. Um, 
because it has big things in it, like a train. Um, so, but um, but there, we just recently did a um, art and innovation inspiration in the wild exhibit um, gallery, gutted a building, totally redid, and that was really to maximize on flexibility because objects do need to be changed out um, just for their own protection, um, and we have so many that we want to share on a rotating basis, the type of things they are, but it gives, yeah, they, they need to be dynamic, flexible spaces. And that's hard because the old model of the museum was something that just never changed. And, um, you know, there's, there's a nostalgic aspect of that. I like when I go to the Met that like this, I've been looking at this since I was a kid and it's right here, but I think I'll live if it moves down the hall or something. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that flexibility is key because, as you said, it was one of the reasons, you know, that we changed from the Adirondack Museum to the Adirondack Experience because there's a lot of activities there for young people. Um, and it's not just – so if you say to a kid, do you want to go to a museum, they're not always that – that's a place they're usually parked on a rainy day, you know. Um, I would have said yes, but <laughs> – um, I, I learn from my students when I teach the museum studies class. I always say the first day, write down all the adjectives you associate with the word museum. And it's never pretty. You know, it's like dusty, old, boring, don't touch. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Not fun. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, they need to change. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. No. <laughs> um, or, Can't. But I'm just wondering your sense of um, knowing that we need to change um, the museum structure and uh, the removal of the colonial or colonial settler sort of perspectives and wanting to bring in some of the traditional ecological knowledge, traditional cultural knowledge, mm -hmm. all of that into displays and uh, knowledge sharing. How does a community decide what is appropriate to share or want to share, knowing that they also want to keep a lot of their culture somewhat insulated because of what has happened in the past? How does the community, if they can even share that, how do those conversations happen? I think that almost anything around ceremonial life, we do not share. Um, but in terms of... Uh, value systems or beliefs and ways of living, I think mostly we do want to share. And I think some of that knowledge is vital right now, um, especially around ecological issues. Um, it, there is an, certainly among the Haudenosaunee, there's a kind of ethos of sustainability. Now, we don't have the word sustainability, didn't need it because we were doing it. But um, when I say there's an ethos of sustainability, if you look at something like our seven generations thinking, right, that you think every time a really important decision is made in the community, you must collectively imagine forward seven generations, 140 years, however you measure a generation, it's 20 years or more, and think 140 years from now, are they going to damn us for being so short-sighted or praise us for the wisdom of this decision we make today? And think of if that was ever, you know, crossed the mind of the people that were dumping toxins into Lake Onondaga into the 1970s, 80s, you know, they're thinking short term. They're making a buck. They're going to be out of here. They'll be dead before it all happens anyway. So... I mean, that type of thinking has to go. And I think a lot of indigenous thoughts around, you know, taking enough, just enough that you need, not building up, let's get it all and then sell it at a profit once we've cornered it. It's Our traditions are not capitalistic. And I think we need to revisit those things. So those things I hope we are happy to share um, because I think people need to hear them. But other things, as I said, anything ceremonial um, is pretty much off the table. Some people don't like the idea of sharing language. I, I don't. I think that's the one thing we should all want to share. 
I'd be happy if China learned Mohawk. Fantastic. Guarantee the safety of the language forever. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not, you know, that's not a thing I, I think of as we need to hide it from people. And there's not going to be a flood of people trying to speak it anyway, let's face it. But um, I do have that disagreement sometimes with people in the community. Um, some people don't want Onondaga taught at Syracuse. And I think that's tricky because I want it taught, you know. And some people are only going to learn it in university. I don't think a flood of, you know, frat boys are going to take on a dog. Uh, um, uh, it's hard, you know, and it's, and it's not going to be, I, I just know that, you know, Seneca is taught at UB without great detriment to the community. And I think Mohawk is taught other places as well, including in Canada that we want. I'm always impressed when I see like a really healthy language. Um, I have a friend who, types really fast in in Cree syllabary and I'm like damn that's impressive you know I did ask my Mohawk speaking students which I have a good number of I said can you text in Mohawk and they're like sure and they showed me and I was like well way too old to I mean <laughs> I immediately shut down but um but they couldn't I thought again that guarantees the health of the language because if they're texting in it then it's going to continue you know yes Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, they do. They definitely do. Um, sometimes I get it. Sometimes I'm just like, I don't know what that refers to, but I probably shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I think a part of, like, my mother said, and when she was a kid, like, they would, one of their family friends was a great basket maker, Sadie Curlyhead, and she would have the girls make the starter part, you know, right at the base, and then the, she would work from, but she wanted a bunch of them, so they were ready at hand, and I think they got a quarter for each one. But those are the opportunities when you're not only learning something like that, but you're speaking with an elder, and they're often speaking in their own language. And those interactions just need to happen all the time. I think one of the smartest things that was done at Aquasesne was with the children, the very little children learning Mohawk, they had to adopt an elder at the elder hostel where my Duda was when she was, she lived to 99 and she, I partly credit those little kids visiting her and speaking Mohawk to her, which she, it really blew her mind because she thought this was a language that was going to die in her lifetime um, because of her experience with schools and so on. And there, you know, they were writing her like birthday cards and she'd have them all pinned up in her room. And I just, you know, Besides warm my heart because of the kindness of it, it was an easy and kind of genius idea because we also want children to be comfortable with elders and not lead very separate lives because when my mom talks about growing up in their house, they at one point, for work reasons, their dad moved them to Niagara Falls, New York, and they had her grandparents, some uncles and aunt, you know, it was all in this very small house. So it was multi-generational and you didn't have this like, I don't know what old people do type of thing. You were with them all the time. They were part of your, a very close part of your family. And that's where a lot of language and cultural knowledge got exchanged. And I, I, I'm glad to see that people are attentive to that still. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I would. I think if it's at that level and you're not going to, I'm not going to shove 
genocide in their face. Um, but I would, um, I'd like them to learn about our contemporary communities now and our life ways that continue. Right. So the kind of thing that you would see in these vignettes on Sesame Street or something where they'd say, you know, let's go to a native, a native American community and see what they're doing. And, um, those are the type of things I like to see done where they're aware that these kids in fourth grade are aware that there are native kids in other parts of the country in their own communities that may have different traditions or, you know, speak different languages, even though they're here, um, rather than it all focus on the past. Because I don't think they're learning that stuff about Squanto and Pocahontas to teach history to them, certainly. It's more of a sense that this is where Native Americans appear in the past, and then you, you, you stop. And I think, just bring it forward. You can mention those figures. They are historical figures. But don't stop with them and, and show that. Like, I um, had a friend in Chicago that, non-Native friend, and his, his daughter was trying to choose a place to have a pen pal. And I said, why not Dineta, Navajo country? And she said, oh, that would be great if I knew someone. I said, I know people there. I, you know, I, used to, I taught in Arizona. And um, her teacher said, it has to be a foreign country. And I said, it is a foreign country. <laughs> Tell her your uncle says it's a foreign country. Uh, so, but um, it, it's just things like that that I wish there were more of for little kids like that that, that aren't, you know, as I said, they're not going to focus them on something horrifying, but then something good that's real and alive. Yes. Yeah, right. right. Oh, a lot of a lot of governors don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I I already mentioned it. <laughs> it's like when did we lose that territory? But anyway, <laughs> please. I think there's a lot of emphasis on continuity um, and the, the through lines that bring things like, like it's fine to talk about the founding of the Confederacy and Ayanwata and the Peacemaker and all that. That's wonderful. But to show the through line of the continuance of our awareness of that so that in you know, the 1920s when Descahe goes to Geneva to the League of Nations to talk about our sovereignty that we haven't forgotten. Uh, you know, a few hundred years of colonialism hasn't wiped away any of that notion of ourselves. And when we see it in, so there's often they will talk a lot about activism and protest in these museums, just to show that through line though, that there was 19th century activism, there was 20th century activism, and we're hoping that it will be 21st century activism. But these are, um, yeah, that we, I think that they emphasize we don't forget ourselves and who we are, but we change, of course, inevitably. Um, we adapt new things, new materials. Glass beads aren't a Iroquois thing, you know, a Mohawk made thing, but we're certainly happy to have them. And just like Plains people were happy to have the horse once it was introduced and hard to think of them without it, right? Mm -hmm. We're on the uh, Great Cultural Center <laughs> in uh, Albuquerque. And, uh, and then one really moving talk uh, is I can't remember what site it was. Mm -hmm. They had like a museum exhibit of um, young people, you know, in the native community who, uh, I guess, Pueblo, who they were still here. Mm -hmm. um, shirts of their own design. Right. And, uh, But um, I think it was Pablo Canyon for sure that 
they had um oops i'm sorry i can they, hear you but yeah, yeah. they had uh signs saying that they were not able to display the objects they wanted to because the Smithsonian had them and said that they didn't feel that the conditions, you know, there were not, mm -hmm. were appropriate for displaying the objects. And I'd like to hear your thoughts yeah, on that. I mean, I don't know those specific objects, but remember the Smithsonian, that employs a lot of hardworking people that are really are trying to make things right, but they inherited a mess. And um, so just getting them NAGPRA compliant, it's an ongoing thing. I mean, the the stuff that was collected, I mean, many of you might be old enough to remember, because it was taught like in the 70s and 80s, Ishii, The Last of the Yahi. It was a famous anthropological book by Theodora Krober. Carl Krober's wife, um, about the last member of this tribal community discovered in the early 1900s as a vagrant, arrested as a vagrant in California. And he turns out to be the last surviving member of his community that had been slaughtered in a massacre by white people. And they're fascinated by him because he's put in the newspapers, living caveman, missing link, all this stuff. And you know, sadly, he's taken under the wing of the Berkeley Anthropology Department under um, Krober and um, spends the rest of his life in a museum, living in the museum. And it's a short life because he will get tuberculosis fairly soon and die. But he begs before he's dying not to be, you know, what do you call it, dismembered and um, studied this way and dissected. And Alfred Krober, not Carl, Carl's the son. Alfred Krober, who now considers Ishii a friend, says, we will not do this to you. But he's away when Ishii dies. He's at a conference in New York, and he telegrams the museum and says, do not dissect that man. And they're like, you know, well, okay. He gets back. We had to because it's too rare an opportunity and so you think, all right, it's a horrible story. Yes, it is. What's more horrible is the story lives on until the 2000s because his brain is kept in the Smithsonian's wet collection before it is finally, with his, the rest of his remains, returned to be buried at a burial site. But, I mean, there's there's a lot <laughs> that that isn't right still in the, in the world of museums. The, the work of NAGPRA the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, is not done. It goes forward. There's always another box they discover, another vault they discover of something horrible. And so it's it's an ongoing process. You know, it's not something that, well, 1990, we can absolve ourselves. It's done. Um, that's when it start, the process started, but it's not done. So, uh, you know, tricky. You know, always, these things are tricky. Yes. Um, so I'm very aware that I'm living on land that was not originally mine, and um, I'm rewriting my will. Mm -hmm. And I, what's a smart way to give back? You know, the problem with giving land back is that it won't go into trust under U.S. law, and that's how it becomes part of a reservation. So a reservation could buy a thousand acres next to it. And that would be held the way that if you bought a thousand acres would be held. That we would say that is held fee simple. You own it in that you own it as property. But to say, well, I'm giving it to the nation, to the Onondaga Nation or something, the trick would be to get the federal government to recognize that it is now part forever of that nation, which would mean it would be received in trust for them. And they are loath to do so. They have just historically, because that does mean giving land back to Native people, and that is not a U.S. goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Declaration, yeah. Declaration on the rights of Indigenous people. Um, 
you you really see in that moment that there isn't political interest in providing recognition and enfranchisement mm -hmm. of Native people in the United States. And so how does a place like the New York State Museum uh, exist in this space of having maybe an ethical um, obligation to display, as you gave an example, um, Native American uh, material culture, say, mm -hmm. or historical life ways, um, on one hand, <laughs> and at the same time is not making commitments to the enfranchisement and full participation of Native people in their own futures. Um, and I, I, I come from Mount Pleasant, Michigan, so thank you for bringing up Zippowing. <laughs> <laughs> but so I have a very particular local understanding of this problem mm. focused in Michigan. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, you for that. No, that's a great question. And, you know, isn't it sad that we don't connect ethics and politics um, <laughs> as though there must be two categorically, you know, opposed, um, which seems so from life. Um, I think that the the museum can understand its own limitations in terms of policy and governance, but it can lead the way as it somehow, as I tried to say before, it implicitly endorsed a lot of the bad policy of the past. If it could change course <laughs> and explicitly endorse a different policy, which might put it at odds with its own government, and then of course there's the issue of funding and so on, that who can say until it's tried, right? Um, but yeah, it's, you know, this is a largely, to my knowledge, friendly audience, but there you could also have a room full of people that hate everything I said. You know, when I, when the Cayuga people are interested in recovering land lost in their home territories, that were once reservations, and then they lost those. And you see these signs in people's yards that no nation, no no territory, blah, blah, blah. This, and it has one of these creepy American names like people for equal justice or something. And you're like, yeah, that means you want to take away my rights, basically. Um, it's one of those, you know, Citizens Committee for Fairness. Mm -hmm. Fairness to whom? And so, and what citizens? So... You have always that group in America that, you know, I remember once one of my academic colleagues said, well, I've never, people don't dislike Native Americans. <laughs> and I said, just go next to a reservation and you'll hear some of the most racist things you ever, it's just not, we're, we're so little part of the population that we're not in your way. But as soon as we are, oh, hell yeah, they hate us, right? I remember going to University of Illinois to visit a friend when they had retired the chief, their racist mascot, Chief Alinewick, and um, people were up in arms about this. And they had signs in their yards, not just like handmade, you know, but someone had produced, pr printed, and distributed signs that said, save the chief, kill an Indian. I said, how's that doing your native recruiting? You know, that must be fun to see when you're a native kid on the reservation, come to visit the school. I mean, just, it's part of this world. It's just not as frequent, you know. But, I mean, whenever there's a, a banging of heads around things like fishing rights or hunting, people go wild, right, in terms of, like, why do they have any rights at all? We conquered them fair and square, you know. I, uh, there was a, a student group at one of my friend's universities that was putting up signs of the whole United States um, that just said, and it was, you know, like in red, and it said, not stolen, conquered. As though that's the justification. I mean, it's some kind of idiotic machismo, you know, I, I don't know. But so, yeah, it's nice to come and talk to audiences that care, but I just know that there are plenty that would be like, we shouldn't do a single thing more for Native people. We've given them so much already. <laughs> Please stop giving us stuff. Um, yeah. We've had issues with school districts 
um, wanting to maintain their mascot. Yeah, yeah. And it's become hideous. Right. And I think educationally, we have failed those parents when they were in school, and we're failing the children who are in school because we give five minutes right. in fourth grade and three minutes in seventh grade to Native American issues. Yeah. And I've had my age group friends ask me, well, what's wrong with being a warrior? And I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to start. So I thought you might Yeah, I mean I I still never know what to do the people that are deeply loyal to a high school mascot. I mean, wow. Um they got a low bar of issues, you know. Um I, I just it it really does baffle me because I just I, I don't get it. But I think People have the sense that something's being taken away from them, regardless of what it's moral or ethical thing. But it's just that, like, that's ours, and you're taking it away, and I don't want it to go away. I don't see it as harmful, and I don't want to reflect on it enough to see it as harmful. And I think that's part of the issue. Um, yeah, sir. Uh, with the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution coming up, um, and speaking of conquest and stuff, um, how does the Haudenosaunee community feel about the Sullivan Clinton campaign and the commemorations that'll be going on in the white community? I mean, how are they going to approach that? Is it going to be through remembrance? I mean, like, just kind of curious. Well, I mean, obviously, most of us who know the Sullivan Clinton campaign as a historical event recognize it for what it is. It's ethnic cleansing, genocide, whatever you want to call it. It was meant to exterminate the Haudenosaunee people. Um, there's divisions within the Confederacy because, you know, there's a there's a trajectory of alliance between some Oneidas and the American revolutionaries. Partly we blame that on Samuel Kirkland's, you know, missionary work. But, um, I mean, it, it's not a thing I'm going to celebrate, certainly, but I, it, because it means the end of our independence as a Confederacy, as a sovereign nation, in that term, in those terms, and being absorbed into U.S. territory. But the Sullivan campaign, I hope if anyone cares to remember it, they'll remember it for what it actually was, which is a genocidal campaign against Native people. And I don't think anyone, I, I, I'd be horrified to find someone celebrating it, because to me that would be like celebrating Wounded Knee Massacre or Sand Creek, just because you're a settler. Um, it's a vicious thing, and I, I would hate to think it would be celebrated. The revolution, you know, it's inevitably going to be celebrated. Though, again, when I talk to my students, it's not that they just don't know about indigenous things. They all, if I were to say Sullivan Clinton campaign to my undergraduates, they would think, Bill Clinton? You know, you know I mean, Ed Sullivan? You know, they're just not clear on because there's not that much of a stress on that type of history anymore. You know, they, they basically know who Washington was. But, um, it, yeah, it's in a pretty sorry state of affairs at that regard. But for us, it's, you know, we, we commemorate aspects of that because we survived it. Um, but that's the only way I would think of. Have you been approached about any museum exhibits or... or no, I have not. I mean, not on that. And I wouldn't be their guy. I'd say talk to someone more sympathetic. Yeah. But no, I haven't. Yep. Um, you correctly, I think, pointed that funding is a major problem for why a lot of museums, probably especially smaller museums, um, aren't able to change their exhibits. Um, I would wonder how many either grants or endowment opportunities are available um, that focus on maybe changing Native American exhibits. And then maybe if there are a lot available, is the problem more that museums aren't aware of these opportunities? And how can we make them more aware? Uh, that's a good question. And I think that there are, I mean, I think the the, the problem overwhelms even the the generous sources that are there, meaning if if every museum that 
was in a position to apply for such funding were to apply, only a handful would be able to get them just because there's not infinite amount of funding, right? And so you do have some major allies out there, whether it be the Luce Foundation or the Mellon Foundation, um, sometimes the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, we'll see where the Ford Foundation is going since it kind of has pivoted away from supporting graduate education, which was their main uh, funding commitment. Um, they say now they're going to be applying their vast amounts of money on a much broader level than focusing on graduate students of color. I would hope that they would become a major funding source because they have a ton of money. Um, but I, I still think the problem outstrips the amount of, of funders. Um, it's a tricky thing because when you're fundraising for a nonprofit, people want to see something more glamorous than corrective in a certain way, you know? Um, and I know this from various boards that I've sat on, not just the Adirondack Museum, but sometimes you something really necessary, like, but boring, like an HVAC system. It's really <laughs> hard to promise them when you're going to put their name on it, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, the Washington HVAC system. But um, so th there are limited... But there are a number, and I think they're increasingly, um, the internet is useful in that regard of making, you can go to sites and see what are the lists of funds. So it wouldn't take a huge dive for small institutions to, to locate those, but whether or not they'd be in the same ranks of competition as a big museum, you know, the funder may think, well, that huge museum, city museum is doing much more damage being incorrect than that little one out in the country is so we'll get to that later but that's all i could think about that you know yeah in the patrol oh, thank you um in terms of the portrayal of um, native american history and culture how do you suggest both k-12 institutions and further into higher education, um, how we can further incorporate classes um, and give class time to these topics so that um, understanding is improved across just... Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. It's a challenge because, of course, there is only a limited amount of time, but I guess I think if you incorporate as much as possible into the sweep of U.S. history, our continued presence. I mean, the, a number of my colleagues, historians and otherwise, um, we put together a book that was published by Chapel Hill called Why You Can't Teach United States History Without American Indians. Long, prosaic title, but we wanted to make clear what we we're up to. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then it has on the cover the famous picture of Penn's treaty with the Indians, but all the Indians have been blanked out. Because that's kind of how U.S. history feels to me when I see it. And what we do in that book is we're aiming it at teachers. Because teachers often will say, I didn't learn this anywhere. How am I now teaching it to my students? And we can't just say, well, look it up on Wikipedia. No, do not look it up on Wikipedia. So we wanted experts in each period from pre-contact to today to put in short essays with an annotated bibliography or bibliography pointing to further work. If you wanted to do a deep dive, I wrote the chapter on Native America during the Civil War because it just struck me no one had ever mentioned what happens to Native people during that period. Like, what's going on? We're here and, you know, we're in both of the places where there's conflict and conflict spills over into Indian territory in terrible ways. And that's just never, and so if, even if it got a five-minute recognition, that's five minutes more than it ever got before when teaching that course. But it's it's tricky. Yeah. Here. There's two. My name is Clarissa Jacobson. I'm Mohawk from the Akwesasne, and I grew up in Akwesasne, and I work for New York State Department of Education. I'm the Indigenous Education Coordinator for the state. I want to answer 
your question about school mascots because I've pretty much taken a lead on that. We're working. I do have to commend Dr. Rosa for the push to make sure that she stands up for school mascots and she has and she will continue. She has stated. We have it also formed since she has come into the position the Indigenous Advisory Council to New York State Department of Education. And our council is made up of every tribal nation in New York State. And they have our, we have a form of 20 that sit around the table and meet with the commissioner. And they, our next meeting is going to be held actually here in this building. And our, our tribal leaders will come. They'll have a roundtable discussion with the commissioner. This will be our third meeting. We've met here at um, in the commissioner's um, quarters and then to Onondaga Nation we went and now we're bringing it back to Albany. Your question when you talk about curriculum, we just completed the New York State um, Teachers for the Cultural and Language Certification. So we do have that in place. It's a lot of work. I was at the time where there was just... I'm sort of solo in the office. Thank you to the governor who has provided us with a, I now have a researcher and she has done all the academic research for the students that we service 13 school districts in New York state and three on territory. So my position has to, is to make sure that all those schools are funded and the tuition is paid, ordering of school buses supplemental funds, and then on to the higher education of college university students. It's a very big department that I've been in the position for eight years. So we are going to be getting to curriculum and instruction at some point. It's just once I know the school mascots has ended, and then we know that the cultural teacher language, then our advisory council will bring that to the commissioner's attention. So I'm hoping that they bring it in the November's meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that. Could, could I ask if, when you say thir 13 districts, are they all near up north or are they throughout the state? Um, they're throughout New York State. Oh, so they're with each, kind of related to each community. Okay. Yep, That's great. To um, the tribal nations. Right. Um, the two out on Long Island, Shinnecock mm -hmm. and Ongachuk yeah. Nation. Yeah. Work very closely with them. Yeah. Thank the only school district that we really haven't connected with and tribal nation is the Cayuga Nation, and that's because of the issues that are having yeah. that they're having out there. So we don't want to come in unless we're invited in. Right. That's how, how we look at it. Thank you. No way. Hi. Um, speaking of education, um, one of the things that we haven't really touched on so much here today, but is very valid, very needed to be stated comment too is that um, there are indigenous uh, peoples who were removed from New York. Mm -hmm. um, Lenape people, the Delaware Nation, the Delaware Tribe, Stockbridge, Muncie, for example, uh, members of the Cayuga, members of the Tanawa or of the Seneca peoples um, have uh, territories outside of New York State now. But they are still very much having had a history here in New York. Um, and I'm just curious about, uh, you know, we really do focus on the Haudenosaunee in New York. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, how do we bring them back into the fold since they have been even more so removed right. <laughs> physically as well as, you know, in terms of history? I guess my sense is, I mean, I grew up in Western New York as my parents moved to near, well, Niagara Falls, but Tuscarora Reserve, where my grandparents ended up living until very late in their lives. And there, I remember when I would visit, I had a good friend who lived in the Hudson Valley, and they learned, I mean, they didn't learn about Haudenosaunee people, I know that. They were learning about the Lene Lenape and people, and maybe the Mohican people, but I knew that they weren't learning our history. I'm assuming that's still what goes on um, and um, in terms of reconnecting though with those communities that are out of the state I don't I don't know the answer to that because we we have a challenge at Syracuse we have this Haudenosaunee promise you know we want and, and we do get students from Wisconsin Oneida territory but we have never they had a single one from 
Seneca, Cuba, and Oklahoma. And we we want to, you know, we want everyone to come home. <laughs> so, um, but we don't, and we have them from Canada as well. It's not, we don't care about that border. But um, it's really hard when people are away from their territory like that. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, my grandmother is the activist from Arizona, so yeah. I know different religions. Mm-hmm. What's your opinion? I mean, I think, there, and there have been excellent essays written by Native people for the Times and broadly public things like... Um, Phil Deloria wrote a nice piece on, you know, the the real meaning of Thanksgiving. Like, what are we talking about actually happens in this period? Let people know that. I mean, it's weird. Like, it was never a thing we focused on at home as being about pilgrims and Native people. It just wasn't. We had it, I think we all like holidays that revolve around food. But, uh, (laughs) you know, and it was a time that we all gathered. And we were, my my grandfather's from Six Nations, and so Canadian Thanksgiving's on Columbus Day or here or something like that. So we had two, and we thought that was super great when we were kids. A lot of pie. Um, but I, but no one really talked about the, this American story of pilgrims and all that stuff. I'm sorry. Usually some of the pictures that the kids have brought home is showing a different picture to what I believe and what my parents told me. Yeah. No, it's, it's a difference. they're not getting the real, because the, it's, again, it's this kind of prettified, nice, happy, slappy, you know, it's all good. I said, who celebrate, you know, inviting people for dinner and they kick you out of your home? You know, it can't be good. So. <laughs> yeah. Like a personal one, I just have the boring school one, like. I am. Um, but no, <laughs> I wouldn't have the time to maintain it. <laughs> yeah. What was the name of the book again? With a long title? <laughs> um, well, not, I mean, they're in no way at odds with each other, but it, it's, it's just a, it's organized by kind of classic U.S. historical periods. Um, so that it can be inserted into that long-standing kind of American curriculum. The book is called Why You Can't Teach United States History Without American Indians. Um, and it's Chapel Hill, I think 2012, maybe 17, I forget, 12, I think. Um, and again, yeah, and I'm not shilling for it because I don't get a penny for it. I don't, I, all of the, its profits go to the um, Indigenous Studies Center at the Newberry Library in Chicago, where a lot of the research was done. Yeah. Sure. Um, speaking to the uh, people that have moved to other places, I went to a... Um, talk by somebody from the Mohegan Nation, uh, from Wisconsin, and almost everybody's in Wisconsin, but um, I don't know where their funding's coming from. I don't know if it's coming from the nation itself or whether it's coming from Williams College <laughs> or Stockbridge or something. So there's actually an office in uh, on the street in, William- in Williams College, and th- when she was speaking, she mentioned one thing they're doing is, um, I guess... There, whenever there's like putting in a new culvert or doing a road in um, Stockbridge, they kind of get a, a chance to look at it from an archaeological perspective. Dis- oh, okay. All right. Okay. So she mentioned she found some pre-contact sites and I guess some other sites. Okay. So I don't, I, anyway, I learned something from her, but I guess I didn't realize it was, uh, um, you know, she said that was what was keeping her busy, basically. I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So what changes need to happen so people can give land back? 
How how do we how do we move forward with that? I mean, that would be a federal issue because the federal government is the only one that has legal say so over such things. It's not a state issue, um, so it would have to be effectively the state or the federal government saying that they would agree that this land could be returned to a native nation. And when I say held in trust, uh, that is the reality of it. It's still held by the federal government in trust the way that a um, national park is held in trust. Right? It's You cannot sell your you can sell your land to a nation, but it won't be considered a nation the nation's land. It will be it would be like if our nation were to buy a bunch of stores somewhere that we'd own them, we'd have proper rights over them, but they wouldn't be part of our nation. So it's just the difference between held in trust as part of a native community or just held fee simple the way you own your yard type of thing. So you could give your yard to my nation, but we couldn't call it reservation land. Probably. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's trouble. There was, there is some land that was turned over to the Mohawks of Aquasasne. It's not far from here in Fonda, New York. And Tom Porter, who's an oh, elder, yeah. who runs that, runs it. And it's not recognized by New York State. And the St. Regis Mohawk tribe also does not interfere with them. And in order to reside there, you have to get permission from Tom Porter has a board. So if I want it in a Mohawk, and I'm from the same place he is. I have to go through a board in order to ask, can I reside here? Can I put a little, you know, live a little piece of land over there? And I would probably be denied. There's another piece of land that's not far, and it was turned over. And now that was turned over to Mohawks from Akwazasne. And it's not far from where I live. I, I'm in, I, I bought a home in Boston Spa. And mm. so if I wanted to go and live there, I wouldn't be able to live there. So I'd be very careful about how you want to turn over land to whatever tribe that you decide to or nation and do your, um, you know, make sure you know, is this land belong to the Mohawks or the Onondagas or Senecas before just turning it over or wanting to turn it over. Um, I know, um, no, the universities will, um, they're, they're always looking for, you know, um, like an archaeological dig and SUNY Potsdam. Um, they have a great program that um, ran, there was many students who ran through their program and um, many of them have gone on and to work into museums now. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, it's just a matter of um, reaching out to the, you know, the right people. So you just want to, just want to let you know, just, you know, do, do your homework. That's all you have to do. You can go to the tribal nations, um, request them, you know, meet with their tribal leaders and, you know, you know, have a, you know, your discussion, propose what you want to do, let them think about it and let them give you that answer. But just handing it over just to anyone is just be careful. You. You're welcome. Yeah, all of those are alternative things to do. Okay, I think I've sung for my supper. I will get <laughs> Thank you. All right.